Welcome to Therapy and Theology. I'm Lisa Turkhurst, and I'm here with Dr. Joel Munamale and licensed professional counselor, Jim Kress. We are in the middle of a series, and today we're on part three. The series title is Let's Stop Avoiding This Conversation. And today's focus is on commonly debated and often misunderstood scriptures that seem to silence women. In the last episode, we talked about personal silencing. Today, we want to talk about public silencing. And I'm going to jump right in and read one of those scriptures that, let's be honest, we are not going to fully be able to land this plane today because scholars have been debating these uh, scriptures we're going to talk about today and this one uh, for many, 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 many years. But I do think our conversation will be helpful. The verse is this, 1 Timothy 2.12. I do not allow a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. Instead, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. Mm. Okay, Joel, I have a story that I'm going to share. But before we get to my story, I would like for you just to pre-tackle that verse. I thought you were going to say to pray. <laughs> Lord knows we <laughs> need it. <laughs> yeah, we, we pray before said. Uh, pre-tackle the verse. Um, I think one I want to just address what you just said, Lisa, that um, the expectation at the end of the session, I don't think is going to be, or this episode is going to be, oh, we figured it all out. You know, what the aim is will be to maybe bring to light, bring to surface some of the cultural situations that are taking place, um, the creation situations that are taking place, and to give us a framework to rightly understand or at least begin to navigate what does this verse actually mean and and how should it be translated to us today because often uh, verses that are used that uh, are weaponized are um, ignoring I call it theological dishonesty there's there's a bit of dishonesty around uh, the original intent the the cultural context and so that's kind of the, the aim and I think this is going to be incredibly helpful um, and here's the other thing y'all and I think it's really important that we approach this this is my my personal conviction I know Lisa you and Jim share this too that we approach Approach these verses with a posture of humility mm-hmm. and charity mm-hmm. yes. and consideration. So if you're at a coffee table with some of your girlfriends and they view this in a totally different way, we hope, my prayer is, that you can come to the conversation with, have you considered this? And then begin to have honest, open dialogue that will move you forward into relational um, integrity and understanding. Mm-hmm. And here's a ground rule that I would suggest is that we don't want to take any scripture, but for today's conversation, we don't want to take this scripture that I just read and weaponize it against people who have interpreted it differently. Mm -hmm. And so we ask you not to do that to us. And we promise not to do that to you. And when you do have conversations with your friends, we ask that you not do that to one another. We don't want to violate scripture in an effort to defend scripture. And Joel, I love what you said with a posture of humility. So I'm going to open up with some personal experience. Um, I am a rule follower and I am a serious studier of God's word. I have a deep conviction that I want to honor God's word. I want to live out what God's word says, and I don't want to bring personal opinion and make that my primary focus of interpretation. Um, I believe that We've got to get into God's word, let it get into us and let it inform us, convict us, challenge us and encourage us. So um, my personal story with this is because I am a serious Bible student. When I read this verse, um, and give me the reference one more time, it's First, First Corinthians 2.12. 2, 12. When I read this verse, um, I didn't know what to do about it. Because I have felt so very called by God to teach God's word. And my primary focus is teaching to women. Um, And yet sometimes I'm in positions and in circumstances and situations where there are men there. And I believe that men can get a lot from my teaching as well. I don't 
understand um, why the anatomy of my body should dictate the value of my words. Mm -hmm. And yet, if God told me clearly not to speak, I would absolutely be obedient to what the Lord says and what the word says. As I got into studying this verse, though, I realized that there were some cultural and um, really insightful ways to study the scripture that don't become as obvious just reading it at face value. And so you and I spent a lot of time, Joel, um, really digging into not only this scripture, but several scriptures that we'll um, look in today. And it's because if bottom line, if I'm not supposed to teach God's word, then I need to know that. Mm -hmm. So, um, so after much theological study, uh, we landed in what I felt what was a good place. And um, I did definitely still feel called by God to speak and to teach and at times to even preach God's word. I'm not a pastor and um, I want that to be clearly stated. And um, I don't need to be placed in authority over men. I don't. I don't, I don't have some burning desire to prove a point and do that. And I want to be careful with every bit of the nuances of these verses. But um, I do feel like that I have faithfully taught God's word and um, I've received criticism because of that. And it would be so easy for me to be publicly criticized to the point where I decided just to stay silent. <laughs> One of those criticisms came actually from a woman who held a different view on this verse. And she was publicly criticizing me, um, you know, writing things about me, leaving comments on social media. And the biggest one of all was um, publicly telling people to not engage with any part of my ministry because I was basically a heretic. Hmm. So I decided that these kinds of conversations and uh, if we were going to have a healthy conversation around this, then I needed to be humble enough to listen to what she had to say, to listen to her concerns and be willing if there were things I needed to learn from her to learn from her with the hopes that she would also listen to me and potentially mm. learn from me as well. So we set up a phone call and, um, I very quickly discerned my hopes for the conversation to be a healthy dialogue were not going to happen because it really turned into a monologue where she um, had such strong thoughts about this verse and about how I was violating this verse um, that by the end of the phone call, what I had hoped would happen, that she would be able to share and teach me her research so that I could factor that into my research and we would have a healthy conversation about it. That did not happen. Um, she got to share everything she wanted to share. And I respectfully um, realized that she was not in any kind of mood to hear what I had to share. I was able to share a little bit, but not as much as I wanted to. Mm -hmm. So um, the conversation ended and I cried. Um, I wasn't crying because I felt like I was doing something wrong. I cried because two Christian sisters couldn't come together who both love the Lord, who both hold to the same tenets of the faith. And yet a couple of verses in the Bible were making such an opportunity for the enemy to get in between us and cause such division and so much hurt and pain. So I just asked the Lord, am I wrong? And I want to be careful here. I don't know that God spoke to me in this moment. And I want to always be careful not to assign something to God that maybe just popped in my own head. So this could be what popped in my own head. And maybe it wasn't from God at all. But what I, I was just sort of overwhelmed with this response. Like, am I wrong on this? Should I be silent? Should I stop preaching and teaching um, God's word. And what I heard was, you're both right. Mm -hmm. The one who is supposed to speak and teach and preach is doing that. And the one who is supposed to stay silent is doing that. So you're both right. Now, what I don't want you to hear in that is that I am bashing this other woman and saying she should stay silent. 
I think that she has a lot to share. And I would still, to this day, love to hear from her. But if her conviction is to stay silent, then there's a reason that her conviction is that way. And my conviction is different than hers. That doesn't make me a bad person. That doesn't make me less of a Christian. It makes me a woman who is very passionate, just like the Samaritan woman, just like Mary and Martha, just like the women who discovered um, the empty tomb. It makes me very passionate. I have had an experience with Jesus, and I just can't keep quiet about it. Jesus has changed my life, and I believe my personal testimony is right in line, and the teaching that goes along with my testimony is right in line with what we see in Revelation, and that is the enemy is defeated by the blood of the Lamb and the word of the testimony, and I don't believe my testimony should be disqualified, nor should my teaching be disqualified, and that's not based on public opinion. That's based on our research. Mm. So with that, if you're still listening... I'm so happy you are. Joel, I'm going to let you take it away. Yeah, I think that's so important. I want to um, start this with 1 Timothy 2.12 by by addressing the cultural situation. So we'll start with this. Jim, when I say 9-11, what am I talking about? Uh, September 11th, 2001, the country being attacked and the two twin tower, the twin towers coming down, I would assume. But Jim, all I said were two numbers, nine and 11, and I just happened to put them together. Oh, you meant How the, in the phone world, call that you call the police with. Uh, so oh, it could be 911 yeah. without the, the hyphen or whatever in, in between. So this is super intriguing. Um, how did you know that I meant one or the other of those things? What, what clued you in? on like 9-11, September, September 11th. Because everybody knows it's popular in our culture. If you say that it's word association, most people aren't thinking the 911 call. They're thinking, well, come on, you know, 9-11, don't you know? And it provides a common point of reference. Yeah. A common everybody point of reference. So it's everybody, a context. The whole <laughs> culture in America for sure went through everything, a trauma, if you will, together. Yes. Okay. So collective. Um, y'all, I'm, I'm fine. I'm at the age now. I'm in the season of my life when I mentioned 9-11 to my children and they're like, huh? Yeah, fine. they're like, what, what do you quick. mean? What do you mean, Dad? Um, and, and I think I want to use this as an illustration. When I say something like nine eleven, it's interesting that everybody in this room can locate themselves in a historical, social, cultural, geographical situation. We know we're talking about the United States, and we're not talking about India. We know we're talking about uh, a uh, New York City, you know, and we're not talking about Florida. Like instantly, that happens. Why? Because we're keyed in on a cultural, situational context that defines, it brings understanding and a framework around these words that are put together. So let's go to 1 Timothy 2.12. I do not allow a woman to teach or to have authority over man. Instead, she is to remain quiet. And then Paul goes on in verse 13, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. Um, Every text has a context, and that context determines meaning. This is like a a basic foundational, it's a big theological or a a biblical word, I guess, hermeneutical method, the the method that we study the scriptures from. Now, here's what's interesting. Just above this, starting in verse 9, let's see, yep, verse 9, this is what Paul says. Also, the women are to dress themselves in modest clothing with decency, good sense, not with elaborate hairstyles, gold, pearls, or expensive apparel, but with good works as is, a, as is proper for women who profess worship to God. A woman, and then he goes into 11, a woman is to learn quietly with full submission. I do not allow a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. So the big hermeneutical theological question is, why is it that so many that would hold such a strong, like, um, aggressive interpretation of First Timothy 2.12 are typically okay with, you know, some jewelry, with a wedding ring, with hair that is done in, in, in braids? What changed? Well, I want to go to the cultural issue. What Paul is dealing with is the city of Ephesus. And in Ephesus, uh, this was the topic of my dissertation. So I spent a lot of time in Ephesians and the city of Ephesus. There was this massive temple, the temple of Artemis, one of the nine wonders of the world. And at the temple of Artemis, there was a cult at the very center of the temple. And that cult was a prostitution cult. 
Hmm. Yeah. So you would walk in and you would see women that were dressed with elaborate hairstyles, gold pearls, expensive. Like this is almost a copy and paste, a photograph of what's happening in the Temple of Artemis. So so what's happening? And again, another illustration. If there are two church, if there's a church and there's a cult right next to the right next to the church, and you know the cult because everybody who walks in those doors, right? The the symbolic identifying marker is red hat and red shoes, mm-hmm. and everybody who walks in wears red hat and, and red shoes it, it, this they'd be like it's probably unwise for us to wear a red hat and red shoes and walk into the house of god why it could be really confusing for a lot of people wait mm. are you part of the family of god or are you part of this cult you know this thing that's mm-hmm. happening over here this is where i'm gonna land and i'm gonna suggest again with with humility and charity like i really believe that what paul is dealing with here is is tightly connected to a cultural situation where you have the temple of artemis and you've got uh cult prostitution that's taking place and the goal always from from the old testament all the way throughout the new is that the people of god are 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 set to be holy, set apart. They're not to look like, act like, or to become engulfed in the culture of the time. They're supposed to be set apart. Why? So that the culture, uh, the people of the world can come and be invited into the family of God. So this is speaking to a pretty specific situation. And it was necessary to have clear distinctions between what is being um maybe taught or even perpetuated over at the temple of Artemis. And then what is being taught in the synagogue or the church, right? Right. And so here's the other thing is we want to take one verse and and, and view it in light of uh, the rest of the canon of scripture, right? Elsewhere in in, uh, first Corinthians, Paul's totally good with women prophesying. He's totally good with women taking active participation in worship services. Right. Um, And so why we are have to ask this, question, why would there be this kind of definitive statement here? And remember, these are letters that Paul is writing to specific local churches that have specific people in mind and a specific context Mm -hmm. in mind. Here's the other interesting uh, cultural situation. There is what was known as um, the cult of Sybil. Uh, The cult of Sybil was this kind of cult where um, women had made this theological argument that they are actually superior than men in hierarchy. Like, like they're, they're it. They're the, the peak and the pinnacle of all of creation. And so it's this heresy that was kind of coming around that now Paul is looking at and saying, whoa, hold on, hold on. This is not a, 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 a Sybil, like we're not doing that. Actually, we have to go back to creation. This is why it goes to Adam and Eve. We have to go back to creation. How are Adam and Eve uh, created? Well, they're created in oneness, in the same image of God. There's no room for a superiority complex. And then the other massive theological challenge here is when he says uh, in verse 12, I don't allow women to teach or to have authority. So what does that mean? to teach or to have authority. The Greek word for authority here, here is authention. And I'm going to just be honest. It is the most, if you were open to open up a commentary on first Timothy two twelve, you will have pages of, of commentary and notes spilled here. But here, here's what I think is happening. And I'm following some scholars like uh, Tom Schreiner, uh, Dr. Linda Belleville, uh, Dr. Nijay Gupta, where authention is, um, is this word that is being used to describe a type of authority. Hmm. And the type of authority is like a hostile, domineering, demeaning type of authority. And so if that's the case, it starts to pit, put some puzzle pieces together for the larger context of 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 12 of, okay, so you've got this temple, you've got this cult, you've got this women that are like being super angry and aggressive. And now you've got Paul who's coming in and saying the gospel is a different picture. The gospel is a different picture. It's where men and women are united in the likeness and image of God. And there's no room for either or for one to be superior and one to be inferior. They both have to be elevated together. And so I think well, if and you've also, got that. Joel, let me say one thing here. I also think, and this is important to state, that it is also making sure that the image of God is in the men is not devalued. Now yeah. we've talked mm-hmm. a lot about the, yeah. um, because of the Imago day, not devaluing a woman, but there's also place in the conversation that it seems as if Paul is saying there are circumstances happening where men are being devalued and 
it is an offense to the Imago Dei in the man. Yeah, exactly. And and so some some would say, well, Joel, then he goes to a creation argument. And I'd say, absolutely, he goes to a creation argument. And and here's why I think he's going to the creation argument. Again, I'm following um, New Testament scholars on this, is um, Adam and Eve are both together vice regents of creation. They are both royalty. They are both sons and daughters. They both hold um, a specific responsibility with intrinsic value. The image of God is um, a status that is bestowed upon humanity that cannot be revoked. And that status requires a standard. We we are to live up to the status that is given to us. The fall breaks humanity, doesn't break the image of God. And so the fall mm. makes it hard, impossible really, for in our humanity to live up to the status status, right? So how does that come together? Well, I think Paul is being brilliant, like Paul is. He's a brilliant theologian and scholar. He's saying, we've got to go back to the ideal of Eden. We've got to go back to where men and women, and, and you know, we could do so much work here. In fact, I wrote uh, an entire theological paper that kind of unpacks all of this, and we'll make that available for you in the show notes as well, that goes through the Old Testament language, the New Testament language, and how it's connected together. But the language in the Old Testament, it's about... Um, human oneness and not human hierarchy. Mm, wow. That's it's, so good. It's human oneness and not human hierarchy. I think it's also a nod to a Trinitarian ethic of the oneness of God. And yet even in the Trinity, we see it, that there is an economic, I'm using some technical terms, there's an economic distinction in that the Son is the mm-hmm. Son, the Spirit is the Spirit, and God the Father is God the Father, and yet there are three in one. It's one of the core tenets and beliefs of the, of the Christian faith. And that's really modeled in even how God created man and woman. There is a oneness that comes together. And I think this is exactly what Paul is bringing uh, back to the forefront. So Jim, I want to know, you see so many women in your office um, because you deal with partner trauma and um, the work you do is so significant. How, how many times does the public silencing of a woman play into the overall hurt that she has experienced and, um, Hmm. and complicate the healing that she needs. Well, these again are conversations that even the three of us have had, you and I certainly have had that not in a particular order. A big one is, well, yeah, whatever he's done, fine. You just need to forgive him and quick. Secondly would be, uh, and again, we talked on this on one to two podcasts ago here, that you, know, you ought not, buy, even out with a Christian counselor, you ought not be out there telling you stuff of your bedroom or telling stuff that's private. So you need to keep that. You, you don't betray him or don't go into a counselor even and tell what you're struggling with, ma'am, uh, if your husband doesn't approve of it. And there are men, and I've seen wives too, saying, I don't want my husband to go into counseling. It's about secret keeping. So it's as though there is this pull back of simply telling the narrative, simply going in, naming, not blaming, and saying, here is what's going on. And then we've talked about the spiritual abuse side, which I do call it that too. If there's a sense of weaponizing God's word and almost taking these passages that we just went through and saying, you should not even speak in public to a counselor, you know, don't tell that that's private. And people, a lot of the women I work with get confused, you know, a question is this biblical or am I violating God's word by simply coming in and telling the narrative? Mm. They're confused about that. And are they confused because they have misunderstood scripture or is it um, that they've been taught? Both. I hear Um, both a lot. And... And they, in their integrity, don't want to violate somehow God's word. They say, mm -hmm. well, if it says this, that I shouldn't do that. And the big one is, is am I almost here? I have been betrayed by a spouse, for example, infidelity. Uh, And in infidelity, and then if I go in just to tell the story and tell his secret sins or whatever, I'm betraying him. Like, no, that's not betrayal. He might think it is, but that's not betrayal. That's telling the narrative in the Word of God. I just literally, in God's Word this morning, sitting with the door open, the beautiful weather we had here in Charlotte. And what man covers, God will uncover. He will bring into the light. I don't know when, but there are other passages in the Scripture. Plus, I love 1 John 1, 7. If we walk in the light, think about a husband and wife for a moment. As Mm. he is in the light, lights all over the studio we're in. It is in the light, out of the shadows, out of the darkness. It is there we want. Have fellowship one with another. That's where we can meet. And by the way, whatever you bring in, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from 
all sins. Mm -hmm. But there's just this sense of, I don't, anybody's ever had a teenager, you know it. Get up, time to go to school, get up. And they don't, you go in and click the light on, ah, turn that light off. John 3 talks about evil deeds and darkness, right? So I see that piece is a woman's trying to come in almost with a dimmer switch and just lightly turns, can I turn the light on my reality right now? and share what's going on, and she can think she's betraying her husband or doing something unbiblical. Not only do I think that there are scriptures that are misunderstood mm -hmm. and possibly even weaponized against women, but I also think that there are some common phrases that it's assumed they're in the Bible, and mm -hmm. that's also playing into this, when in fact, those phrases are not in the Bible. I bet there's yeah. a lot of those. And some examples of that is, um, well, one example is forgive and forget. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. Joel, we did <laughs> over a thousand hours of theological study around the topic of forgiveness in preparation for me writing my book, Forgiving What You Can't Forget. And we never found that where it says forgive and forget. God will throw your sins to the depths of the sea to be remembered no more. Which Judicially, is right? Judicially. It's an anthropomorphism, yeah. right? It's it's uh, anthropomorphic. It's uh, a human characteristic that's applied to God to give us an idea. It's it's an image. Uh, and yet God is sovereign and omniscient. And so he, he yeah. knows all, you know, Absolutely. but isn't this so in intriguing that we've taken a statement out of context, stripped it, and we've taken a biblical principle, which you can't get around. We get into this and in forgiving what you can't forget, uh, at least in your book, uh, that forgiveness is a command, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and yet that statement and phrase is never in scripture. Mm -hmm. And also the therapeutic side of this is sometimes it, it's like, I don't know an exact phrase that people assume is in the Bible, but this concept is once you forgive, you're never to mention it again. In other words, once you forgive, if you forgive, then there is the sense that the healing is complete. They quote me, Paul's pedigree. He listed all the stuff he'd done in his pedigree. Then he says, well, that's just done. Forgetting what lies behind, I press on. And people say, well, the Bible says forgetting what lies behind. And I went, well, let's check in with the source, the woman in this case you've heard. Can she forget it? And if Afi Amy, one word for forgiveness means to cancel the debt, sir, can, would you be willing to sit with your wife and explore the debt, we know the debt, the overall residual impact of our sin collectively put Christ, he became sin who knew no sin on the cross. Would you be willing to look at the debt, even the Lord's model of prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and see guys shut down. There's nothing in there. I go, but the Greek words is saying, dude, it's, it's forgiving the debts. Walk into the debt, own the impact and see... In many cases, a fellow shut down, like, I don't need to do that. She just needs to keep moving. I'm like, hmm. And elsewhere in Matthew, there's a parable that Jesus gives of um, the the king, basically, who forgives a debt, a severe debt for uh, a citizen. And that person goes, as soon as he's forgiven <laughs> of that debt, and he goes and he chokes, chokes out the guy. Yeah. the guy that owes him a fraction of what homeboy owed, owed the king, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so that's another example. Well, are we supposed to forget completely? Well, no. Actually, I think what it is, it's, it's an awareness. Mm -hmm. We we need to be aware, and the, another word, uh, Greek word for forgiveness is charizomai. It's a, a phrase that Paul kind of coins, uh, and he does that often in the New Testament. And it's a grace-laced type of forgiveness. Yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, mm -hmm. comes from the Greek word charis, which means grace. But the idea is that, yeah, we forgive. It's a gracious type of forgiving. However, it's also judicial in the sense that... We're to be aware of the great debt that we have been forgiven of, lest we act like that man who is forgiven and and totally miss the fact that it is expected of us to now live out the consequences of that type of redemption and forgiveness in our lives. That's so helpful. And so I think we see that sometimes verses are weaponized or misinterpreted. Sometimes there are assumptions made about what is in scripture um, and it's not actually in scripture. And then sometimes we take a verse that was meant for a situation and we use it as a broad sweep sweeping application. First like Corinthians 14, 35. All time. Okay. So let's go there, Joel. Yeah. First, can, for you, you just said it. First Corinthians 14, 35. So I'll kind of read this and um, I'll start in verse 34. Uh, Paul says, the women should be silent in the churches for they are not permitted to speak, but are to submit themselves as the law says. If they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, since it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. How does that make you feel? There's a long pregnant pause there. Did you notice that? It's like, 
Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, how many times have we heard that? Well, the Bible says. Mm-hmm. Paul says, mm-hmm. First Corinthians, right? Now, I'll give a little bit of, of context here. Um, Paul, again, is speaking to a specific church. There is a, there's an understanding in Greek rhetoric, which Paul is, is deeply steeped in. It's called the Greco-Roman world, right? Um, Hellenism, Greek culture has invaded. It's been part of the Roman culture, and it valued conversa- conversation. It valued dialogue. And what Paul, I think, is getting at here, and I'm following uh, Scott scholars like Craig Keener, Leon Morris, Ben Witherington, that say in in rhetoric, it was very common for, let's just say our conversation here, I get done with this. At the end of it, Lisa, you critique me. And you say, well, Joel, that sounded great, but what about this? And what about this? And Jim, you would critique me and you each have your area of specialty. A lot of people don't know this, Lisa, about you, but if I could, I'd give you an honorary PhD in Jewish culture and context. I mean, the things that you know about Israel and Jerusalem, it is so brilliant after years and years of study. So you are qualified to critique me and to ask me that questions. Jim, therapeutically, you say, Joel, I, you know, that's great, but what about the, you're qualified, right? In the culture at the time, and this is, again, this is the subtext around what's happening with women and silencing and all the things that we're talking about here, this long overdue conversation, it was not normative. It was uncommon. It was actually intentional that women were uneducated. They weren't given the opportunity to learn. They weren't. And now all of a sudden the gospel comes in and Jesus has Mary at his feet. And, and the first evangel, uh, evangelist of the resurrection, the key eyewitnesses are women. It is disrupting and turning the Roman world upside down. And, and here is this little church that's present. Now, here's the challenge. Paul wants order. Paul wants us to speak with understanding and with wisdom. And so what was happening in some of these churches were people were getting really zealous and excited. And now it became disruptive. It was, you didn't really understand the context, what was going on. And it took away from the preaching of the gospel. Notice, and it took away from learning. From learning, exactly. But notice what Paul does. And I'm going to quote from, um, from Keener. He says, um, Dr. Craig Keener, he says, instead, he provides the most progressive model of his day. Their husbands are to respect their intellectual capabilities and give them private instruction. I would say, Joel would say, to what end? So that they could then participate in the mm. in the in the rhetoric in the future. And it's not just uh, Keener. Leon Moore says Paul is here concerned with the way that women should learn, not that they don't learn, and not that they're just to be silenced, but actually to to encourage them and to equip them. And um, I think that is an incredible, important aspect because once you have that understanding, much more difficult for us to just hijack 1 Corinthians 14, 35 and be like, yep, Paul said it. And and do broad sweeping and application, do, all women, all time. All women, all time. Mm-hmm. Um, let's go back to the verse that we read at the beginning. 1 Timothy 2, 12. First in 1 Timothy Um and you were talking about the Temple of Artemis and the women there and how they were distinctive looking. Isn't it true that some of those women were going into the church and it was causing confusion sure. inside the church? Sure. So when you saw a woman that had the distinctives, like you mentioned, red hat, red, red shoes, that's not what it was in in that context. Yeah, it was of, gold, pearls, braided hair. Exactly it's all that's the list that he that he mentions. Yes. And what were these women doing when they would go into the church? So there, there's a little bit of, of debate on what's actually happening here, right? And it really doesn't matter where the debate is because it what matters is how Paul is addressing them. The, the identifying marker of them, and Jesus does this elsewhere when he tells us to treat people like Gentiles or tax collectors. If somebody came into the church and they're dressed in this way, it's one of two things. One, they're curious about the gospel, Right. There's all of a sudden a Jesus who evaluate, who redeems and values. And, and so they're, they're curious, they're skeptics. The second one could be, and I think this is a valid possibility that they're coming to disrupt the church. Mm-hmm. They're coming to lead them astray. It doesn't matter which one you land in. Both go to the basic foundational understanding that we need to be aware of. We need to know why, what is the goal so that we can woo them, that we can pray for them, that we can invite them to be part of this family um, of God. And so super confusing if all of a sudden 
they start dressing like them. Right. And this is even a cultural kind of conversation in today's world. The idea isn't so that you and I look more like the culture. It's actually an invitation for the culture to reflect the goodness of the kingdom of God that is coming at the end, that Jesus is going to make all things new and bring the new heavens, the new earth together. And yet there is a real um, warning that Paul gives, and it's all over the place, actually in the New Testament, that we should not be conned into acting like and placing our lot and our um, affections and our loves into the culture. We're supposed to be inviting them to come into the family of God. So mm-hmm. are they the women that he was instructing or that he was referencing when he said they should remain silent it's in that very, context? Yeah, very well could be. Because imagine them being in there and mm-hmm. all of a sudden they're speaking out and they're causing chaos and they're, you know, and then it's like, yeah, it's and about church order. It's about church order. And was there also a reason? I mean, you pointed to it a little bit when we were in the other verse in Corinthians, but um, was, would there be a reason for all women to have stayed silent? It doesn't. It's it's <laughs> you're about to get me going on myself. Up. <laughs> it is incongruent with the rest of scripture. Right. So this is that that brought if this was the case. Then Paul would have said, by the way, women shouldn't prophesy, women shouldn't pray in public. All of these, it is incongruent with his larger teaching, which then forces us to deal with the cultural context. And if we deal with the cultural context, now it's about wisdom of saying, how far are we going to go with this? And I think this is where we have to be charitable. It is very possible for brothers and sisters in Christ to look at it and land in different places and personal conviction. But that personal conviction should not be elevated to a place of you're in the family of God or you're not. There, there's place for disagreement and, 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 um, and a difference of opinion in these types of things. But this overarching broad, you know, proclamation that all women at all times should never speak. It's just not present in the text. You'll be hard found to find, you know, actual legit scholars that are going to suggest that it's just incongruent. And sometimes when we hit upon verses that are so challenging and there are many different interpretations and and convictions that people have after reading these verses. I like to say, well, let's go look at the word made flesh. Mm. Let's go look at the Jesus context. And when we go to the Jesus context, Jesus very much was aware of God's desire. (laughs) Jesus was very aware. And so how did Jesus operate with women? How did he handle ministry with women? And do we find cases where Jesus silenced the women? And if so, then why? But in many cases, if not, then why? And when I started doing that, I started to recognize like we said in the very first session of of this series, um, or the first episode of this series, I started to recognize that it's important to bring the value of a woman and how Jesus valued the woman into this consideration. Mm -hmm. And I ended the episode one of this series by saying, what if the Samaritan woman had been silenced? Mm. And why would we ever want her to be? What if Martha, who was the first person that Jesus in the book of John, that that Jesus reveals, I am the resurrection and the life. What if she had stayed silent? And why would we ever want her to be? Hmm. And if the women at the tomb, what if they had stayed silent? And why would we ever want them to be? I think looking at the life of Jesus, it's important to also factor that in here. So, Jim, any parting thoughts? That's some deep waters we just traversed, and I love it. Um, I love that you land the plane back on Jesus. I, on a personal note, um, and I think a theologically accurate note, just love just gently reading the text of his involvement with women. I don't he- hear him shaming them clearly with um, the Samaritan woman, he's breaking certain rules. I mean, I think he knew that, uh, that he says, yeah, I will have these conversations um, on a very 
practical note, I think this is true also for me around uh, churches, like we talk about the more corporate church. The idea is, in my opinion, in my belief, is Lord have mercy. I want the voice of women involved in every aspect. Does that mean she can do this and do this role and all that? But the idea that there is so much that men are there leading, and I know because I'm ordained as a pastor myself, and people would say in church work, I've been, yeah, but I go home, my wife's my advocate, and she's there, and she says, I wouldn't have said that to them. There's so much behind the curtain where women have advised pastors who may say the woman can't preach or teach and all like that. Sometimes that's not true. But I'm thinking just to have the woman's voice there male and female distinctively. And if she is the Ezer, the Ezer Konegdo, even that strong, suitable helper, I hope more and more that women, and I'm going to say it my way, that women don't have to just wait for a man to give the place, like in a marriage or a relationship, to speak your truth. For me, personally with my life, if Jessica, my wife, had not gotten and still does get in my way, and she does it gently and firmly, and to say, I don't believe you want to say that, you want to change that? You want to back that up? Like I can be in the flesh. There's biblical language and I could be harsh. And she would say, do you really want to say that that way? I verbally and emotionally abused my wife in our marriage. We were in therapy, in therapy 20 years, basically off and on. I did that. I was a, a different show, right? But uh, in a pornography addict, that's massive abuse. And so I have worked hard to change. And I want to offer hope to anyone out there that a person can change if they're willing. But with that, that women will just continue to name it and say, this is what it is with an energy that has a vision for that guy, not to condemn him. He's condemning himself, believe it or not, already. But that women would say they give themselves permission. And I do that in my office. Give yourself permission to speak the truth. Ephesians 4.15, speak the truth in love. I don't think she needs anyone else to give permission. My thoughts. That's so good, Jim. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you for your testimony as well, just mm-hmm. around what you've seen um, and how you've seen this mm-hmm. improve in your own relationship with Jessica yeah. and in your marriage. Um, you know, again, I want to encourage anyone listening. This is the start of a conversation. Good. This is not meant to be the stopping point. That's right. Um, we are informing you, but we want you to dig into scripture. We want you to do your own research and we allow space for your personal conviction and we will never condemn you for those mm-hmm. personal convictions. Um, you know, one time someone said to me on the flip side of this argument, Lisa, you know, why are you not demanding a seat at the table? And there it is. again, I thought to myself, that's not the best of who I am to walk into any situation and demand a seat at the table, you know, because I don't, again, I don't want to violate scripture in an effort to defend scripture. Hmm. I don't want to suddenly walk in full of pride and all puffed up and, you know, and, and it's just not even part of my makeup to be that kind of demanding woman. Right. Um, and so my response back to them is, you know, if I demanded a seat at the table, I may be given a seat at the table because I'm a woman. But I don't want a seat at the table just because I'm a woman. Mm. I want to bring so much value into every atmosphere that I walk in that it kind of becomes slightly irrelevant in the context of my value that I'm bringing. It kind of becomes irrelevant whether I'm a man or a woman because my value speaks for itself. What I'm bringing to the table is so important that Maybe I get a seat at the table or maybe I just get to speak at the table or maybe some other decision is made. But if I bring enough value to the table, then I will be valuable. And so as we close today, I just want to say, please don't take this podcast and start (laughs) forwarding it to all of the pastors, you know, that you think need to be righted on this or all of your family members that, you know, have a different view on these verses. And, you know, this isn't meant to prove any kind of a point. 
It's meant to open up the conversation and the dialogue and to have the humility to say, I want to bring some theological wisdom into this conversation. So thank you, Joel, for providing us Mm. with theological wisdom that we may or may not have had access to um, without you sharing it. And so I think it's important. And as we wrap up today, I just want to say to anyone listening, male or female, You are valuable because God says you are valuable. And if there's places that we get this wrong, then we'll have to answer to God for that. But here's my thought, my closing parting thought. I would rather stand before the Lord and have him tell me I was too eager to share Mm. than to stand before the Lord and have him say, why didn't you share? Mm. 